Good evening, my name is Roxanne Chabot from RBC Consultants. Welcome to another International Dermatology Education Foundation Educational Series webinar. This evening, we're gonna be talking about updates on atopic dermatitis and skin of color, a dermatology and allergy perspective. This activity is jointly provided by Educational Med uh, Medical Education Resources and International Dermatology Foundation. This activity has also been supported by an educational grant by Insight Dermatology. Our chair this evening is Dr. Brad Glick. Dr. Glick is member of the AAD Board of Directors, Residency Program Director, Larkin Palm Springs Hospital, PIGSI Clinical Research and ASDS Advocacy Ambassador in Miami, Florida. As speakers, we have Dr. Andrew Alexis, who's Professor of Clinical Dermatology, Vice Chair of Diversity and Inclusion, Will Cornell Medicine, New York, New York. Also a speaker, Dr. Ama Alexis, Pediatric Allergist, Allergist Clinical Assistant Professor, Department of Pediatrics, NYU Grossman School of Medicine in New York. And also Dr. Adelaide Ebert, Dr. Ebert is Professor, Department of Dermatology, Director of Pediatric Dermatology, Chief of Pediatric Dermatology at the McGovern School of Medicine and Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital. We'd like to thank Insight Dermatology for making this educational event possible. Before we begin, a couple of logistic tips. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the information will be displayed. If you're having technical issues or if you would like to submit a question to our faculty, please use the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will be emailed to you within one to two days. We'd greatly appreciate it if you can fill it in and send it back to us. Also, a certificate will be issued to you one to two days after the webinar. Please again, fill in the survey to uh, submit your accreditation points and the credits must be claimed by January 1st, 2023. Again, if you have any questions, please use the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. And I wrote a little note there so you can see where you need to type in your questions. This activity has been designed to meet the educational needs of dermatology healthcare professionals involved in the care of patients with atopic dermatitis. There's a knowledge gap among healthcare providers on how to treat atopic dermatitis among their skin of color patients. The objectives will be to identify and improve understanding of the pathophysiology of atopic dermatitis in general and skin of color in particular, and identify and improve collaboration between allergists and dermatologists. This is a jointly accredited uh, activity between Medical Education and Resources, International Dermatology Education Foundation. This activity was planned and interprofessional continuing education credits will be offered, two IPC credits, for physician, two AMA PRA category one credits, for nurses, two ANCC credits, and for physician's assistant, two AAP category one CME credits. The faculty has reported any financial relationship in this activity to remain and to ensure unbiased. The contents and views presented in this educational activity are those of authors and do not necessarily reflect those of Medical Education Resources, International Dermatology Education Foundation, or Insight Dermatology. Again, a certificate will be issued upon completion of the evaluation survey. The credits must be claimed by January 1st, 2023. And you place the following link in a browser to complete the evaluation survey and download the certificate. This link will also be sent to you within one to two days of the webinar to your email address. But if you have any questions, you can contact Medical Education Resources at this number or jsykes at cmepartner.org. So is that Thank you so much, and I'm very pleased to, to moderate this evening's presentation on atopic dermatitis. Next slide, please. So as you know, the International Dermatology Education Foundation 
was established by Dr. Leon Kersick, as you see here, is clinical professor of dermatology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and also at the Indiana University Medical Center, and as well in his practice at Physician Skin Care and his research uh, facility, Derma Research, all in Louisville, Kentucky. IDEF is a nonprofit organization whose principal mission is to raise awareness and improve dermatologic care all over the world through education, especially in underserved areas. Next slide, please. So there have been numerous previous educational sessions uh, with IDEF, particularly uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, many educational series in areas like tonight in atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, uh, vitiligo, and a whole host of immune-mediated skin diseases. And as you see here as well too, a number of these programs have engaged uh, leaders in uh, uh, industry and with many of our industry partners. Next slide, please. So we have a robust agenda this evening with three fabulous speakers. Uh, first, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Uh, um, Adelaide Aber, and then Dr. Andrew Alexis, and Dr. Emma Alexis. Uh, I'm pleased to pass this off uh, to Dr. Aber first, and then afterwards, uh, she will pass the baton as well to Dr. Andrew Alexis, and then Dr. Andrew Alexis accordingly uh, to Dr. Emma Alexis. It's very unusual that we can have three experts pediatric dermatologist, a pediatric allergist, uh, and as well, a leading edge dermatologist and Dr. Andrew Alexis. And so Dr. Aber, you can just uh, jump back on and we're very pleased to uh, hear your first talk here uh, about the evolution of treating atopic dermatitis. So Dr. Aber, take it away. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dr. Glick. I'm really excited to share with you a brief history and overview of atopic dermatitis, where we've been and where we're going. And Dr. Alexis, uh, the dermatologist, will sum up a little bit of the newest directions uh, in the arena of atopic dermatitis therapy. Let's talk about first who was among the uh, dermatologists describing atopic dermatitis. This credit goes to both Fred Wise and Marion Salzberger, really renowned early dermatologists. The term atopic dermatitis was actually introduced in 1933. It was based on the definition that we use for the term ATP, which it was coined back in 1923 by Arthur Coco and Robert Cooker. And it recognized really an association between asthma and hay fever, a well-known recognition today. Um, in terms of uh, defining the disease, that was really the first step in, in aligning what we now know is atopic dermatitis with the underlying both pathophysiology, the clinical findings and so forth. But early on, even when I was a resident, I know that was quite a while ago, uh, we really didn't understand the pathophysiology the way we do today. We had a much more limited uh, basis on which we based our therapy and our overall approach to patient management. We did the best we could, but our really th we had very limited therapeutic options. So what were the early strategies for atopic dermatitis, despite the fact that they were limited? Some still line up with what we do today, prevention of scratching. That remains a challenge. We also were told to reduce triggers, including wool, soap, extremes of climate, avoiding irritating chemicals. And of course, it was also one of the things to avoid smallpox vaccine. I had eczema as a child. They delayed my smallpox vaccine uh, for many years, but I did ultimately wind up getting one. Um, also, there was a big push for restriction diets. And this, of course, led to increases in allergic responses, such as peanut allergy, and I'll certainly believe that Dr. Alma Alexis will talk a little bit about this in her lecture that follows. So what are the other early therapies for atopic dermatitis? Well, we still use phototherapy, but tar played a key role just as it did with psoriasis. Zinc cream was applied to the skin. There was zinc paste with coal tar mixed with it. We had occlusive bandages, as I've illustrated here, hospitalization, which still can be employed today in our most serious cases. In the 1950s, there was the introduction of a revolutionary therapy, topical steroids and oral steroids as well. So in terms of the early therapies, we are seeing sort of a resurgence with some of these. In terms of TAR, we're really returning to therapy with the aerohydrocarbon blockers. We also have topical steroids that go through many evolutions. 
We went through a, um, a product that's a topical device called the Topoclair. It was really antecedent to our understanding of ceramides within the skin. And we now have ceramide containing moisturizers. So while these are more current, there's still some of the earlier therapies that were employed. I don't know how many of you actually recognize this particular flower, but it played such a key role in the development of current steroids. I want to talk a little bit about that history with you now. Back in the 1940s at the Mayo Clinic, two individuals, Edward Kendall and Philip Hinch, one was an endocrinologist and one was a PhD, actually administered very small quantities of cortisone to patients who had rheumatoid arthritis. And these patients were absolutely um, defined by their disease. They were in wheelchairs, they couldn't walk, and they gave this medication to them and these patients got up out of their wheelchairs and walked. You can imagine the excitement in the medical community when this happened. Uh, they called this compound, compound E, and they really saw these patients ultimately move freely and very painlessly. This actually got reported on the front pages of newspapers, it got reported in Life magazine, and it was considered as an important discovery in medicine as penicillin or insulin, and I would agree with that. These uh, two uh, colleagues were uh, so impactful in the discovery that in 1950, they actually won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, and it certainly was deserved. Now, there's a lot more to the history of cortisone. At that early stage, it was very difficult to produce. If you think drugs are expensive today, wait till I tell you what it cost to make cortisone in the earliest time. And it was, of course, in very short supply. To actually get cortisone, they had to get the bile from 40 slaughtered cattle to make one dose. So the cost was about $1,000 a gram. I think that exceeds any topical steroid that we might use today. So steroids actually have a configuration of bile acids, and there was actually 40 different chemistry steps needed to convert it to cortisone from this uh, bovine bile. And that wasn't very efficient, even though they knew the chemical structure of cortisone, a number of scientists wanted to find a simpler and really more cost-effective means to produce this particular product. So some organic chemists really searched for a natural product with an oxygen molecule in the C-rings 11 position. They were very thoughtful in this. And what they actually found, um, that this chemical could potentially save 17 steps in the bile-based process. So it made a lot of sense to look at this. Now, actually, the flower I showed you has such a key role in steroid history because um, that particular flower is called Strophanthus sarmentosus, and it was seeds from a mislabeled sac that actually contains such a compound. So serendipity and science once again travel together hand in hand, and how lucky we were in dermatology that this accidental discovery occurred. So this is Strophanthus, and it is actually the seeds of this plant from which the original cortisone was derived and it was synthesized from this seeds of this plant. Here's a little another vignette about the history of steroids. President Truman actually wanted to find a plant that would allow the production of steroids. So he asked the US Department of Agriculture and the National Institute of Health to do collaborative tests on over 5,000 plants. And this is one of the plants that actually did lead to some discovery. If any of you ever go to Las Vegas, this plant is right at the airport exit. So um, look for it when you're out there. Uh, Strophanthus is actually a climbing shrub. It has that beautiful funnel-shaped flower, and it's usually found in dry deciduous forest in Africa from Senegal to northern Angola. Uh, this picture I actually got from a dermatologist in Florida, and he was very kind, and he gave me a picture because he said he always kept this flower in his garden because it meant so much to him in the daily practice of dermatology. Uh, another phys another um, scientist, Russell Marker, who is a chemist at Penn State, identified the best source of the plant, and he actually um, developed techniques to convert this plant-derived steroid into useful products at a much lower cost and, of course, of course a greater yield. Um, it's interesting that our colleagues in Japan in 1936 also discovered something called sapogenin, and it was actually found in the tuber of an Asian yam, and so they call this particular product diazogenin. And looking at diazogenin, you can see this chemical structure is very, very close to cortisone. So our organic chemistry colleagues could very readily perhaps cause conversion and get from diazogenin all the way to cortisone without too much challenge. 
Russell Marker, the gentleman I mentioned from Penn, actually found uh, a similar uh, chemical within what's called the Mexican yam. And these tubers contain about 5% diazogenin. These uh, tubers weigh up to 100 kilograms, so it was a ready source of this particular agent in the synthesis of steroids. Russell Marker was a true entrepreneur. He actually quit his job at Penn State. He moved to Mexico City, and he founded Syntex Corporation. And he wanted to use this corporation to pursue uh, steroid production. The U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture actually tried to grow these yams in experimental gardens, but they were unfortunately not able to do so. So steroids uh, ultimately became something that were able to be synthesized within a chemical lab, and that's how they're made today. And we have many widely used steroids that are still derived from extracts of this wild Mexican yam. So an interesting bit of history. That yam is not related, of course, to the yams we just enjoyed on Thanksgiving Day. Who are the early dermatologists who applied these steroids into the dermatologic arena? It was actually, again, uh, Dr. Salzberger and Dr. Witten, who reported in the Journal of Invest Investigative Dermatology in 1952. They used these uh, products on selected dermatoses, of course, with good outcome. And there was also the use of a synthetic uh, cortisone in the eye, in allergic dermatitis and psoriasis, uh, published by Spies and Stone in Southern Medical Journal uh, back in 1950. So very early, early articles. Uh, we have, of course, new concepts among the arena of atopic dermatitis, looking at the barrier, allergy, and pruritus, and these are considered a trinity. We know from this uh, cartoon that barrier disruption plays a key role, but also itching, environmental factors, uh, basic cytokine production, all of these really have a key interplay in causing atopic dermatitis. We also note that there's diminished filaggrin in some of the patients who manifest atopic dermatitis and even allergy uh, conditions such as asthma. So the barrier abnormality thus must not be thought of as just an epiphenomenon. It's really one of the initiators of pathogenesis of the disease state we know is atopic dermatitis. Now, what do we look for when we're looking for moisturizers in atopic dermatitis? We've learned, indeed, these are key components of our care. We need one that repairs the barrier. It has to be hypoallergenic. We want it to relieve itching. It needs to be well-tolerated. And it, we want it to reduce transepidermal water loss. So what, what was derived to meet many of these qualifications? There is a product which is considered a medical device called atopiclary. It went through um, double-blind uh, controlled studies, and we participated in these, and indeed it has come to the market. Again, it's not considered a medicine because it, it does not have a medical basis, but it is considered a moisturizer. It did reduce transepidermal water loss up to 72 hours, so it was a step forward in the history of atopic management. This is some, one of the studies that was published in uh, 2008, looking at this particular agent as a new uh, vehicle, uh, a new agent actually in the arena of moisturizers for atopic dermatitis. Going on, uh, this particular product is considered steroid free. It was calcineurin free. It was actually useful in maintaining acute and uh, chronic phases of atopic dermatitis. It was considered anti inflammatory and had anti itch properties. So going forward, we gained increasing depth within the arena of atopic dermatitis as we came to understand the genetics and the basic science. We also came to recognize the important role that ceramides played in both the barrier, barrier restoration, and we learned about therapeutic moisturizers. So I'm going to put forward for you a polling question. So please select one of these answers. You can click on this. Ceramides remain at normal levels in the skin of patients with atopic dermatitis. Ceramides constitute the most important polar lipid in the outer layer of the skin. Ceramides, ceramides have identical structure of natural moisturizing factor. Ceramides con constitute the smallest component of polar lipids in the outer layer of the skin. Ceramides comprise less of skin lipids compared to cholesterol or free fatty acid. Please go ahead and Register your vote.
All right, I think most of you got this right, and I'm thrilled to see that you recognize that ceramides constitute the most important polar, polar lipid in the outer layer of the skin. They are actually the most abundant polar lipid in the outer layer of the skin as well. So that's great that most of you already knew that answer. All right, um, let's go on to look at uh, flagrant abnormalities. We know that from early studies that flagrant was reduced in the granule layer in both ichthyosis vulgaris, where it was first reported uh, by Virginia Seibert uh, in the Journal of Investigative Dermatology. And we subsequently learned from our colleagues in Ireland that we also don't have uh, the normal amount of flagrant in many of the patients who have atopic dermatitis. Uh, this mutation actually is present about 10% of Northern Europeans. And so we know that this does play a role, but not every patient with atopic dermatitis actually has this flagrant mutation. We also learned about the role of Staph aureus. And we know the skin does not have to be truly infected for Staph aureus to have an adverse impact on the skin. I view uh, Staph aureus as a driver of the disease state. Even colonization can drive this disease and make it more difficult to control. So keep this in mind. We do need to pay close attention to microbial colonization in addition to skin infection when we're managing patients who have atopic dermatitis. We also know that Staph aureus has the ability to activate superantigen-specific and allergen-specific T cells. It can inhibit T regulatory cells and elicit antitoxin IgE antibodies. This can also induce steroid resistance. That's why our colonized or infected patient may not respond to the therapy that they used before, especially if it's a topical steroid. So how do we decrease global colonization without systemic antibiotics? That was a challenge we faced for quite a long time. Some of our colleagues have produced uh, literature that suggests that dilute bleach baths and intranasal mepiracin can assist us with that. We know, of course, we've had subsequent uh, studies that have shown just regular bathing might help with reduction of colonization. So I put forward both of these particular papers and just remind you that uh, this can be adjunctive therapy, which can show beneficial outcomes in patients. Simply going swimming in, in a swimming pool can also um, moderate the colonization on the skin and can be helpful. Just want to share with you this particular study, which was really a landmark um, article when it appeared, and it helped validate the fact that dilute bleach baths and intranasal mupirocin can help patients do better in terms of their atopic uh, dermatitis outcome and the reduction of colonization. It wasn't a study that resulted in eradication of Staph aureus, but theoretically did decrease the numbers. Also, the ease of this particular strategy and the cost effectiveness was very attractive to all of us who manage patients within the atopic arena. Here's one of my patients with a defective barrier. You can tell the patient's been uh, scratching, and I believe this patient probably has colonization with Staph aureus. So what about ceramides? Well, I mentioned that ceramides are the most important and most abundant uh, polar lipid in the outer layer of the skin. They also have a role in binding water. And here's an illustration that talks about the combination that we see in the skin, the cholesterol, the ceramides, and the fatty acids. We see the hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions. It's very important to recognize this lipid bilayer has played such a key role in the barrier defect component that we manage, hopefully effectively, as we take care of patients with atopic dermatitis. We know there are abnormalities in ceramides in the skin of patients who suffer with atopic dermatitis. This has been well documented. This um, illustration taken from the literature also shows that healthy controls have far more ceramides than patients who have atopic dermatitis. If you note carefully at the two bars on the right, the middle and right part of the slide, those patients who have lesional atopic dermatitis have the least amount of ceramides of any of those characterized here. Non-lesional skin in atopic patients is also deficient. That's why using a moisturizer, particularly a moisturizer that contains ceramides on all skin surfaces is really important in the management strategy of patients with atopic dermatitis. We know that we have ceramide dominant barrier repair creams. These really accelerate barrier recovery and normalize uh, barrier function and stratum corneum integrity. We really wanna have these normal layers um, of the lipid component of the skin. And I think this beautiful article by Chamlin and colleagues 
that appeared a number of years ago in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology was one of the first to illustrate with its electron microscopy that these lipid bilayers could be restored simply by ap applying the proper emollient with the right ingredients, especially those that contain ceramides. So again, ceramides are the most important uh, lipid in the outer layer of the skin. I know many of our patients want to take something away. They want to eliminate a single food or a single something that would make their atopic dermatitis go away. I try to emphasize that they really need to add something back. And that important thing that they would add back is a moisturizer that contains ceramides. Uh, we have uh, in not such uh, recent time, but in the history of atopic dermatitis therapy, we have a multivesicular emulsion uh, moisturizer formulation that gave sustained release of ingredients over time. This really allowed those patients to apply their moisturizer once or twice a day and actually derive the benefit from this sustained release of ingredients over the full 24-hour uh, period after these agents were applied to the skin. Now, how do these physiologic um, and non-physiologic lipids uh, differ when we apply them? Well, non-physiologic lipids actually sit on the surface of the skin, but our physiologic lipids actually have the ability to penetrate in and really protect the skin, uh, getting all the way uh, into the through the stratum corneum and into the dermis and allowing the skin to be highly moisturized. So it is important to use these uh, constructs as we design therapeutic strategies for patients with atopic dermatitis. Back in 2000 and 2001, we had the first introduction of topical calcineurin inhibitors. We know tacrolimus came out in 2000, and pomicrolimus for mild to moderate atopic dermatitis came out uh, in, in 2001. We unfortunately did get a black box warning in 2006, but there are some ongoing um, assessments to look at these tools. Uh, the black box warning has been removed in some countries outside of the United States, but it does remain as part of our FDA package for these particular drugs. Uh, more recently, we've had the first topical, PDE4, introduced in December of 2016. Crisabrol is that agent. It is approved down to uh, actually three months of age um, as of March 2020. This is a BID application. It is, again, one of the first new medicines we've had for quite some time in atopic dermatitis therapeutic strategies. Now, we are excited uh, to know that we now have biologic therapy. These are relatively new. We know we got the first adult approval for dupilumab in March of 2017. Uh, we were very fortunate to get an approval down in, uh, to age six months of age in June of 2022. Uh, we also have trilokilumab. It's another uh, biologic agent that tar targets IL-13 specifically. With, that one was pr uh, approved in December of 2021, but it is only an adult medication at this particular time. So again, our armamentarium has expanded considerably. We're very fortunate to have these drugs. I believe they have truly changed the landscape for many patients. We're also very fortunate that dupilumab has indications that uh, include atopic dermatitis, asthma, eosinophilic esophagitis, as well as more recently, paragonodularis. We have some new JAK inhibitors in the realm of atopic dermatitis as well. Ruxolitinib cream, a topical JAK, of course, was the very first to be introduced, and it is approved for patients 12 years of age in, and older. This came um, into play in September of 2021. Uh, keep in mind that there is a systemic form, which has been available to treat some hematologic conditions and also treat Graf versus host, which is resistant to systemic steroids, um, since 2021, and the systemic form, despite being available since 2011, does not carry a black box warning. So that should be reassuring to us as dermatologists, even if we use this topical JAK for atopic dermatitis. And other JAK inhibitors uh, include some introduced in 2022. So these are the most recent. We have abrocidinib, which is available for patients 18 years of age and older. These are oral JAK inhibitors. And we have apatacidinib, which is available for patients 12 years of age and, and older. And I believe my colleague, Dr. Andrew Alexis, will go into some of these newer medications in greater depth that I have um, covered uh, briefly with you. So in conclusion, I hope I've given you just a quick overview of where we were, where we've been, 
and where we're going with atopic dermatitis therapy. But we really have come a very long way since the description of atopic dermatitis, which occurred in the 1930s. We realize that these new medications are increasingly available. In fact, we had more new medications in dermatology in 2022 than any time probably in human history. And we have many new medications still undergoing study, and it'll be exciting to have those in our armamentarium before too long as well. I want to thank you for your attention today, and I'm pleased that I have the real privilege to introduce my colleague, Dr. Andrew Alexis, who's Professor of Clinical Dermatology and Vice Chairman for Diversity and Inclusion at Will Cornell Medical Center in New York. Andrew, we're glad to have you, and take it away. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ambert, for, for that kind introduction and for your wonderful uh, uh, first lecture of our program this evening. Um, I am going to um, pick up where Dr. Ebert left off and go in a slightly different direction and, and highlight um, some of the key differences of atopic dermatitis uh, when it presents in patient populations with skin of color. And I'll talk about some clinical variations and uh, nuances to the overall approach to treatment. So when we think about the global population, the world population, already the majority of the world's population would characterize itself as, as uh, uh, having um, richly pigmented skin or skin of color. And here in the United States and throughout North America, this is a rapidly growing segment of the population. And so there is uh, increased uh, interest in understanding potential variations uh, across different racial ethnic populations when it comes to dermatologic disorders. And atopic dermatitis is certainly no exception, uh, especially considering how heterogeneous this, this disease, atopic dermatitis, is. We do see uh, a whole range of differences in different patient populations. So before I continue, let's start with a polling question. The polling question is, well, what is different? about atopic dermatitis in populations with skin of color. What do we know to be different? So you can uh, just select one answer, um, and it includes is it the prevalence, the persi persistence uh, of the disease, uh, clinical features or morphology, skin barrier properties, or all of the above. So please go ahead and, and put in your best answer, and we'll see how it all um, shakes out. Okay, 91% uh, say all of the above. So we are all on the same page. And what I'm going to do with the next, the remainder of my uh, presentation is highlight what these differences are and what the evidence for them um, is, and hopefully give you some pearls as far as uh, enhancing um, your ability to uh, take care of these patients uh, with the best outcomes. So while there are indeed differences in structure, function, genetic factors, um, uh, across different uh, racial ethnic populations, we cannot overlook the fact that there are a whole host of uh, non-biologic uh, factors, including social determinants of health, that also contribute to some of the variations that we see, and in particular, some of the disparities that we see in care of um, atopic dermatitis, among other dermatologic conditions and medical conditions. So starting with epidemiology, there are numerous studies that show that atopic dermatitis is more common in, in uh, specific populations with skin of color. Uh, most of these studies involve uh, comparisons uh, between uh, self-identified uh, Black or African-American uh, children compared to white children. And uh, this is one example of a large epidemiologic study from the U.S. showing that higher prevalence in Black children of 15.89% versus 9.7% in white children. And this, uh, these differences uh, uh, persisted even after controlling for potential confounders like household income, uh, metropolitan versus rural environment, and other potential confounders. Another study, also from the U.S., again, showing a higher prevalence uh, of atopic dermatitis in black children compared to white children. Beyond the United States, there, there are some other studies, including this one from the U.K., which uh, looked at uh, cases of atopic dermatitis diagnosed by a dermatologist in London and found uh, a higher prevalence of AD uh, in uh, Black children of Caribbean descent residing, born and raised in London, uh, compared to their 
uh, white counterparts also born and raised in London. Um, and again, they, these, this difference in prevalence persisted even after uh, uh, adjusting for potential confounders. Another study, this one US-based, this is, was the prospective longitudinal cohort study. And being a prospective study, we're able to, to, to see incidence of AD, but also very interestingly, persistence from early childhood to mid-childhood. And in this study, uh, AD incidence and persistence were higher among non-Hispanic black children compared to white uh, non-Hispanic children. And that's shown uh, in the figure here, and you can probably focus on the top right uh, where you see significantly higher uh, persistence of AD uh, from early childhood to mid-childhood among uh, non-white uh, racial ethnic groups, specifically uh, Black and Hispanic children. Now, another way of looking at the overall burden of atopic dermatitis is, is healthcare utilization. And there are studies that show variations um, in um, healthcare utilization between different racial ethnic populations with higher rates uh, uh, of visits per capita where atopic dermatitis is diagnosed among Black or African-American patients, as well as among Asian and Pacific Islander patients. In fact, a six-fold higher visits per capita rate in, among Asian Pacific Islanders where the, the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis was made. And this is not due to greater health care utilization overall, because these same groups actually have a lower overall uh, utilization rate. So it's specific to uh, atopic dermatitis uh, as a diagnosis. So what might account for some of these differences? Um, so in addition to non-biologic uh, factors, like we mentioned, social determinants of health and other uh, environmental factors, there might also be some uh, uh, structural and functional variations that could explain, at least in part, some of the differences that we see. Let's start with epidermal barrier. So there are some studies, uh, including this one. This is from, uh, from Denmark, looking at three different um, racial ethnic populations, all residing in Copenhagen, Denmark, where they looked at ceramide content by, in the stratum corneum by measuring the ceramide to cholesterol ratio um, in these three groups. And they found that uh, uh, the uh, cohort of African descent uh, had the lowest ceramide to cholesterol ratio, and this was statistically significantly lower than the Asian cohort versus the, uh, as well as the uh, white or Caucasian cohort. And there is a US-based study that also uh, arrived at similar conclusions. And so this might, at, le at least in part, explain uh, our observation in, in clinical practice of the overall burden of dry skin, cirrhosis in our patients uh, of, of African descent. It certainly is also more uh, striking uh, visually and is also culturally stigmatizing to have dry, ashy appearing skin uh, among many uh, patient populations of the African diaspora. And this does influence what the norms are, the cultural norms are for skin care and moisturization, uh, where we do see a heavier emphasis and cultural acceptance for moisturization practices throughout the African diaspora because of this tendency for cirrhosis to be quite visible and, and uh, um, uh, stigmatizing. Now, moving beyond uh, uh, stratum corneum differences, we all can appreciate that there are a whole range of clinical and phenotypic variations that we see in our practice when we, when we treat a diverse range of patients. The most notable difference in patients with skin of color is that erythema, that clinical sign of inflammation that we rely on uh, in so many different ways. Um, the erythema, even though uh, it, it comes from the, uh, the Greek word for red and, and, and classically does mean red, uh, I, I think it's useful to broaden that definition when we think about the, the more diverse range of complexions uh, that we see. Uh, and so instead of red, erythema might present with shades, with a whole range of other shades. And essentially, we have to broaden our color palette. We might see shades of gray. We might see shades of uh, reddish brown. And I'll pause here and just show the contrast between the involved area and the non-lesional uh, area just uh, uh, adjacent. And it's important to look at this reddish brown uh, um, 
a very thin, slightly scaly plaque um, and recognize that it's not just post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, that this area actually is an area of active inflammation. And uh, honing in first on, your non on the non-lesional skin and then moving over to the lesional skin and doing a delta in your mind can really increase your accuracy as far as really appreciating the actively inflamed areas versus uh, areas that are non-lesional. Can really appreciate that color difference. Um, another example, violaceous to gray hues here. Look at that contrast between lesional and non-lesional if you look at the non-lesional skin uh, on the lower part of the neck. Another example, this patient is, has severe atopic dermatitis. Her entire back is, is pretty much involved, but there are these little tiny islands uh, uh, of um, non-lesional or at least less lesional uh, skin where we can get a sense of what her normal complexion would look like. And then you really appreciate the color intensity uh, or hyperchromia of her active lesions. And you can tease out those shades of violaceous to gray and red brown uh, uh, throughout the active areas of involvement of her back. You know, I've, I've been with trainees of various different levels, particularly the, the more junior ones might walk in the room and come back out of the clinic room and say, that, oh, this patient is, has really dry skin and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and completely miss the fact that this is a you know, very severe uh, atopic dermatitis involving the, the whole back and, and other parts of the body. Um, another example of that violaceous hue, you know, in the context of richly pigmented skin, that erythema may, may just look uh, purplish or violet, and, and this is a good example of that, very severely inflamed. So beyond color, we also see uh, some other morphologies more frequently in our patients with skin of color, especially those of African descent. We have a tendency to see this papular or, 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 or this this micropapular or follicular uh, variant of eczema or this morphology of eczema that we call follicular. And we might see uh, these, these papules coalesce into larger plaques as in this example from Ghana. Another example here where um, the, uh, papules have coalesced to a larger plaque and then there's severe lichenification here. And uh, extensor involvement is also something that has been reported to be more frequent in populations of African descent with AD. We can see a severe, exaggerated lichenification of, you know, a marker of chronic, long-standing uh, disease that's been uh, scratched and rubbed. Uh, and we tend to see pretty uh, uh, marked lichenification in, in, in many of the patients we, we see in this patient population. Here's a great example of that, just severe lichenification. And you can also appreciate the color hues again. Look at that violet to gray and some shades of red brown on the periphery of this, and then compare that to her normal skin. And now we really see how intensely, uh, uh, how intensely inflamed that is. This uh, patient, of course, uh, perceived the, the lesion on the back of her neck to be a function of poor hygiene. It sort of resembles a, uh, a dirty neck, if you will, and so she responded by scrubbing vigorously uh, for long periods of time uh, leading up to um, the severe lichenification. And again, so this just speaks to delays in diagnosis and the importance of patient education. Severe widespread lichenification here on this patient with poorly controlled atopic dermatitis of African descent. You also can make out the pigment alterations, areas of hypopigmentation in this case. We often see papulonodular morphologies um, that resemble perigonodularis. Um, um, so we can see morphologies of perigonodularis in the context of atopic dermatitis, uh, such as in these two examples. And we uh, believe that these are more frequent in populations of African descent, but certainly more studies are needed. A lichenoid variant also described more frequently in patients with uh, of, of African descent. Extensor involvement, flap top, violaceous uh, uh, papules. In fact, a very large study, this is the largest study from the African continent that I'm aware of. This is from Nigeria, um, a, a prospective two-year um, study in a tertiary teaching hospital where papular lichenoid lesions were seen in 54% of patients. Uh, so that's uh, clearly a very common uh, variant. And this is a patient of mine, which uh, one could say has somewhat of a lichenoid uh, morphology with these sort of flat top 
uh, papules. And so it's important to look at the whole patient, and be able to differentiate between atopic dermatitis and lichen planus in this context. Now, beyond patient populations of African descent, in East Asian populations, it's, there have been descriptions of, of different morphologies that, are, that tend to be more common, such as a psoriasiform morphology of atopic dermatitis, where both clinically and even histologically in this uh, series that compared East Asian patients with uh, um, uh, white patients described as European American um, uh, patients with AD, and there was a greater tendency towards a psoriasiform morphology in a, uh, the East Asian cohort. I've seen this morphology in other groups as well, such as a South Asian gentleman with a sort of pretty well demarcated scaly erythematous plaque, but uh, he does have atopic dermatitis and is more characteristic in other places of his body. When it comes to the severity of atopic dermatitis, there's evidence that, uh, that we, um, there's a tendency for more severe cases of atopic dermatitis uh, diagnosed among patient populations with skin of color. In this study from the UK, um, it, black children uh, had a significantly higher uh, risk of, of being scored as severe, having a severe uh, severity score on SCORAD. That is only after adjusting for the erythema score. So when erythema was included, uh, this wasn't seen, but when erythema was, was taken out of SCORAD, uh, it, the, the uh, uh, overall severity was greater in black children compared to white children. In fact, black children with atopic dermatitis were about six times more at risk of having severe AD by SCORAD than their white counterparts. And this also speaks to the limitations of our scoring tools and some of the, the, uh, the tendencies to underestimate erythema in the context of uh, skin of color. Another issue that's very, very um, relevant clinically is the tendency for these um, pigmentary sequelae, post-inflammatory pigment alteration, including hyperpigmentation, which can be very severe and disfiguring and just as uh, impactful to the patient as the active eczema itself uh, and can last for many, many years, months to years. Uh, and uh, 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 also, they one can, in addition to hyperpigmentation, we can see hypopigmentation as lesions resolve. And this generally tends to uh, resolve more quickly in my experience, with the exception of when we see depigmentation, permanent depigmentation from longstanding, poorly controlled atopic dermatitis where there's been vigorous excoriation for years to the point of permanent destruction of the melanocytes where patients have scratched so hard uh, and for so long that there's permanent depigmentation. Resembles vitiligo even, or onchocerciasis if it was in, a, uh, in an endemic area. Uh, we can see pigmentary alterations from our treatments, including topical, specifically topical corticosteroids, especially when we use the class one and class two agents. We can um, see hypopigmentation that is more striking in skin of color. There's been a lot of work to try to, to explain these different phenotypes by variations in immune polarization and epidermal barrier protein expression. So in other words, trying to figure out different endotypes that are the underpinnings of the phenotypes that we see clinically. Uh, some of the, the main work has involved East Asian populations with, with a skewing towards TH17, a greater tendency towards TH17 expression compared to uh, uh, white or European uh, ancestry patients with AD. And more recently, work by Emma Gutman and colleagues at Mount Sinai uh, looked at Black or African American patients and found a slightly different type of immune um, uh, polarization of TH2 and TH22 skewing with TH17 and TH1 attenuation. So the, while these studies are small and uh, uh, not yet ready to apply to, you know, broadly to our diverse patient population, it tells us that AD is extremely heterogeneous, not just clinically, but they're also uh, immunophenotypically, and there may be various endotypes that explain these variations, and we need more work to better understand those in specific racial ethnic populations. So what does all this mean for treatment? Um, do we use different treatments for patients with skin of color? Well, the answer is no. We use the same treatments. We have the same therapeutic armamentarium, but there are nuances in the way we use them and our, 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 our overall objectives. So in addition to treating the active inflammatory disease, atopic dermatitis, we also have to manage expectations and, 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 and walk our patients through the long-term pigmentary sequelae as well. 
And given these, uh, uh, the tendency for long-term pigmentary sequelae, and given the tendency for more severe uh, uh, cases that walk into our clinic uh, in, in, in these patient populations, it's critical that we don't under-treat this patient population. Population. We don't underestimate the severity. We, we, it's critical that we put together comprehensive um, and efficacious, safe um, treatment plans to manage our patients longitudinally so that um, we can reduce the sequelae of, of pigmentary alteration and uh, all the disturbance on quality of life that itch causes. And speaking of itch, there may even be racial ethnic differences in the uh, frequency and severity of itch. And there's, there is some work that, uh, that is being done that suggests that. We also have to be mindful of cultural norms and preferences as far as bathing practices and moisturization practices and how sometimes those can in turn impact the severity of the atopic dermatitis that we see in our clinics. Thankfully, we have a whole range of, uh, of, of uh, therapies, newer therapies over the past few years that can, we can target um, specific pathways, including IL-4 and IL-13 uh, and uh, PD-4 and soon uh, IL-31 and uh, other um, uh, key points in the Im immunopathogenesis. And uh, in the topical arena, we, given that atopic dermatitis is a chronic disease, topical corticosteroids are not obviously appropriate for long-term use. And so it's very beneficial that we have a growing list of non-corticosteroid topical therapies, including our trusty topical calcineurin inhibitors, our more recent topical PDE4 inhibitor, Crisalberol, which we heard about from Dr. Ebert, and the topical JAK inhibitor, Ruxolitinib. And soon to come uh, in development in, in phase three for atopic dermatitis are some other additions we anticipate uh, maybe being approved in the future, including topical reflumolast, which is a PD4 inhibitor, and topical uh, tepinarov, which is a oral hydrocarbon uh, receptor agonist. Um, and that Both of these are approved for psoriasis, but are in development for atopic dermatitis. So more, th more agents on the way. However, when we look at access to frontline and emerging therapies for atopic dermatitis, unfortunately, we see disparities uh, uh, across uh, racial ethnic populations. This study showed that uh, uh, black patients in the US were less likely to receive, these are patients with atopic dermatitis, were less likely to receive dupilumab, uh, crisoboral, pim, pim, uh, topical calcineurin inhibitors, uh, even uh, some corticosteroids like desonide. Um, and so this is really uh, alarming and, uh, uh, and a lot of work is being done to better understand these, these, uh, these disparities and improve access uh, for, uh, for our patients of color. Uh, when it comes to safety and efficacy across different racial ethnic populations, there are a few studies that are post hoc analyses of subpopulations of racial ethnic groups, including this of, of uh, topical crisoborol ointment, where there were no uh, differences in, in terms of safety uh, across uh, uh, non white and white uh, patients by comparison, no differences significantly uh, bet between non white and white patients with respect to efficacy. Um, and with dupilumab, a post hoc analysis also uh, demonstrated uh, improvements across all the racial ethnic populations studied. However, because of, uh, of uh, small sample size, uh, some of the endpoints in the Black or African American cohort receiving dupilumab every two weeks uh, had a positive trend, but not quite significant uh, in some instances. And, and this is really due to. Um, underpowering is really more of a statistical artifact rather than a real phenomenon. Um, as, uh, as our clinical experience would suggest, uh, dupilumab is, is uh, safe and efficacious across the range of, of racial ethnic populations and skin types that we treat. These are some examples of patients of color responding very well to six months of uh, du dupilumab. Um, another patient that I showed before, the back, and a uh, um, marked improvement over nine months with, uh, with dupilumab. And we've seen similar things with tralokinumab, uh, which, uh, in, which uh, is an antagonist to IL-13. Interestingly, the concept of being able to control the um, inflammatory and immune 
uh, underlying inflammatory and immune pathways that uh, that uh, lead to atopic dermatitis manifestations. If we do that effectively over time, not only does the eczema resolve, but we give a chance for the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation to also resolve. And that was demonstrated in this uh, report by Candrus Heath and speaks to the importance of longitudinal control. We want to induce remission and maintain it and move away from reactive treatments where patients go on that roller coaster ride of flaring and then uh, going into a brief remission and then flaring again. Uh, and when this happens in patients with skin of color, on top of this, all the, the burden of the disease itself, pigmentary alterations that are long lasting all, will continue to occur. So with that, I, I hope that this overview has been helpful. Some of the key takeaways being that atopic dermatitis in skin of color is more prevalent. It tends to present with greater severity. There are genetic and endo endotypic variations that are being, that are still emerging, that are still a, a subject of, of, uh, of research. There are unique morphologies, including the follicular variant and variations of erythema where we must broaden our color palette and disparities in care that also yeah, impact um, the severity and access to, um, to uh, important therapies for our patients. This is a review article that you can turn to for further reading. And with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Ama Alexis, a allergist in New York, who also happens to be my wife. Um, and I think you're in for a treat for a wonderful perspective of, uh, of an allergist uh, perspective on atopic dermatitis. So Ama, take it away. Thank you so much, Andrew, for the kind introduction. So I would like to give the allergist perspective in terms of atopic dermatitis and skin of color this evening. I'm still muted. Can you hear me now? Good. I'd like to give the allergist perspective uh, on atopic dermatitis and skin of color this evening. And thank you, Andrew, for the introduction. I'm sorry, here we go. And I would like to see whether the slides advance. Let's take a look. Let's see. Okay, great. I'd like to start my presentation with the clinical case because it will highlight a few of the themes that we will all see when we treat patients. Let's take a look. Great. So this is James. James is a 12-year-old African-American who presents with his mother for the chief complaint of having really dry and itchy skin. It's been going on for a while and it's getting, getting worse. He can't sleep, he's scratching throughout the day, he's really flaky, it's embar he's embarrassed. Um, so they wanna come in and understand a little bit better why this is going on. Mom uses mostly organic and natural ingredients and she's very careful with the selection, but James really doesn't like to use these. They've also tried hydrocortisone cream, but they don't think it's very helpful. There is a family history of food allergy. Um, so they're very cautious, they're very mindful of that. On exam, he's actively scratching, and you can see widespread erythematous scaly plaques with like an indication and excoriation on his neck, his trunk, his upper and lower extremities. They have asked their pediatrician on numerous occasions to send lab work to find out why he's so itchy. So the pediatrician finally gave in and sent a panel. Um, and then when the results came back, she said, you know what, why don't you go to see a specialist for further evaluation? They've also been told to avoid certain foods, and here's the list. The list includes eggs, peanuts, soy, gluten, fish, citrus fruits, tomatoes, and canned foods. Now, they brought in the lab work, and we can now discuss the, the lab the results together. The allergic cell is called IgE. It's an antibody, immunoglobulin E. And for his age, the normal cutoff is around less than 600, but his level is clearly elevated to 5,800. What we can also see when we look at algae lab work, we look at two numbers. We look at the absolute number and we look at the class. The absolute number always ranges from either zero to 100 and the class ranges from zero to six. And as you can see here, he definitely has elevated labs. Um, for example, egg is 84, wheat is elevated, barley, sesame, peanut, and almond. But interestingly enough, shrimp and salmon are negative. So there are a few things I'd like to know about James, um, about his diet. So I asked mom, does he actually eat these foods? And she says, yes, at this point, we haven't put him on a diet yet. So I would like to get further testing first. So he's eating all these foods. So then my next question is what actually happens when he eats these foods? And mom says, 
she can't tell because if she's, she's itchy all the time and that's why they're here, they want to understand the history a little bit better. And then my last question is, has he stopped eating these foods? And again, mom says no, because they want more testing. So let's see. So let's take a look at the literature to better understand uh, what we can do for him. And as you can see, Andrew and I read the same um, literature and that uh, this again is the national survey a large population based survey of over 100,000 families representing all 50 states. Again, African American children were more likely than their white counterparts to have atopic dermatitis, even when adjusting for household income, parental education, whether they lived in the city or in the country, and um, their healthcare status. This is a more recent healthcare utilization study in that. Um, we compared uh, Black, Hispanic, and white children and, see, and saw how often they went to see a, a doctor in regards of their atopic dermatitis. In the left column, you can see the white children, the visits. Uh, in the medium column, you see the Black children. And on the right side, we see Hispanic children. And you can kind of see through the visual that there's an elevation of both the Black and Hispanic children. And interestingly enough, it's not just primary care visits, it's also emergency room visits that were more frequent, frequented by Black and Hispanic children. There's also underutilization of being seen by a specialist. Jonathan Silverberg took a look, um, presented data from a prospective cohort in 20 large US cities. These children were assessed at three different time points, at the age of five, at the age of nine, and at the age of 15. And what they found was that the prevalence was higher in black and multiracial children across multiple time points. White children had more transient disease and Hispanic children had a lower prevalence overall. Persistent atopic dermatitis was associated with poor health outcomes overall um, and higher odds of developing asthma. So what causes these disparities, right? Is it all due to genetic factors or more environmental factors? I think this study we've seen, this um, picture we've seen uh, today, this study again took a look at mutations we've learned about phylogeny mutations earlier on, specifically loss of function mutations, which were more likely to be found in European Americans, about 50%. We were able to see these in 27% of Asian patients. And there was this phylogeny loss of function mutations was six times less commonly found in African American patients. And I think Andrew mentioned um, that in Asian patients, they did see an interesting cytokine expression and elevation of TH17 cells um, that led to this blended atopic dermatitis psoriasis and lutite. So nine dermatologists with experts, expertise in skin of color gathered virtually in 2020 to address the question whether there are racial or ethnic variations in skin barrier. And yes, they did find articles in the literature that really support the notion that African-Americans have significantly less ceramides, a few ceramides compared to white and it's uh, in Africa, I'm sorry, compared to white and Asian American patients. They found that skin barrier dysfunction and increased cirrhosis may be due to reduce ceramide levels in black skin. And as we've learned earlier with Dr. Herbert, how important ceramide levels are when it comes to atopic dermatitis. So this group in California took a look at patients. Um, they took a look at the cohort and they recognized that yes, if you self-identify as African American, you ha do have a twofold higher increase um, increased prevalence of having atopic dermatitis. However, if you look at genetic measures, such as African genetic ancestry or the polygenic risk score for atopic dermatitis and for dark skin, this does not increase your risk of having atopic dermatitis. So there's really a discrepancy there. So again, what causes these discrepancies? Why are some patients more severe affected with atopic dermatitis than others? Is it due to genetic measures? or is it due to environmental factors and measures such as social determinants of, of health? What are social determinants of health? The WHO defines them as non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. They are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age. And these circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global, national, and local levels. There's really been a flurry of, public, of um, publications, especially in the allergy world, 
that really shine a light on the impact extrinsic factors can have on disease progression and outcomes, including social determinants of health. This is a great diagram because it really shows us the interplay between these different factors. The relationship between skin pigments and atopic dermatitis risk is complex. And so there is consistent evidence that healthcare factors, such as access to healthcare, period, access to good healthcare, socioeconomic factors like income, wealth, education, and environmental factors, such as which neighborhood you live in, housing, um, indoor outings, outdoor pollution, they all influence atopic dermatitis prevalence, severity, and persistence. And these factors in turn are more common among racial and ethnic minority populations as a direct result of racism. So as the allergist in the room, of course, I'd like to talk about atopy which the term was already um, mentioned earlier this evening. So I'd like to redefine it, at least the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, also called Quad AI, defines it as, as follows. ATP refers to the genetic tendency to develop allergic diseases, such as allergic rhinitis, asthma, and atopic dermatitis. ATP is typically associated with heightened immune responses to common allergens, especially inhaled allergens and food allergens. On their website, the Cord AI also lists potential triggers for atopic dermatitis. They mention irritants, such as chemicals, soaps, detergents, fragrances, fabrics, and smoke. They mention inhaled allergens, such as house dust mites. They mention foods, and they mention stress. Stress including anger and frustration, which can cause additional itching, which then worsens the classic itch stretch cycle. How do we test for foods? That's a, a common question for allergens. So there are several ways, pretty much two ways. Number one is blood work, where again, we look for the allergic cell, IgE, and you can look for specific allergens, such as IgE to wheat, to egg, to peanuts, or to, to cats and dogs. And then there's the skin prick test, which is not a painful procedure. We place a little bit of the allergen on your skin and prick it lightly into your skin. And then we wait 15 minutes for a real and flare reaction. So it's more an itchy procedure versus a painful procedure. The ATP patch test for food um, is not commonly done. We used to do it, at least when I was in fellowship, to look for triggers for eosinophilic esophagitis, um, but the clinical correlation wasn't that great, so we don't do that anymore. The atopic march describes a linear relationship between four disease states, atopic dermatitis, food allergy, allergic asthma, and allergic rhinitis. Only 3% or so complete all cycle through all four diseases. This group in Cincinnati took a look at a, a cohort and followed these kids over time. And these kids were exposed to different race specific risk factors, which actually led to different disease trajectories. So these black children, they started these, watching these kids at the age of two. And these black children with atopic dermatitis at the age of two were more likely exposed to a parental history of asthma, secondhand smoke, and traffic related air pollution. And that actually led to a six-fold increase of developing asthma without developing food allergy or allergic rhinitis. When they looked at these white children, they followed these white children, they were more likely sensitized to food and air allergens, and they often lived with a pet at home, either cat or a dog. And they had a three-fold increase of developing either food allergy or allergic rhinitis without developing asthma. The atopic dermatitis yardstick is a great practical guide to help us with a therapy for atopic dermatitis. When you look at their maintenance therapy recommendations, we also see trigger avoidance, specifically proven allergens and common irritants, such as soap, wool, and temperature extremes, as well as considering comorbidities. Sorry. All right, so surfing back to foods. Um, the quad AI mentioned foods as well. Specifically, they say, watch out for it can be a trigger in very young children in rare and adults and eliminating a variety of foods from a diet that you are not allergic to is rarely helpful let's keep that in mind so food allergy and atopic dermatitis so clearly there is an association between the two of them food allergy has been reported in about a third of patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis Atopic dermatitis is also a risk factor for immediate, IgE-mediate food allergy. In the most common foods in the literature, there's a landmark study 
um, that shows that the most common foods that trigger atopic dermatitis can be milk, egg, and penis. Those are about 90%. They clearly other foods as in wheat, soy, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish can also trigger atopic dermatitis. And here goes our polling question. Okay, what are the next steps that would be helpful for James? Please select one of the following. Number one, send more extensive food testing because that's what they came in for and they want to know what's causing him to be so itchy. Number two, focus on optimizing the skincare and therapy alone. Number three, help him eliminate, uh, ask him to eliminate peanuts, eggs, and milk for a while because we've just learned those are the most common foods that trigger atopic dermatitis, or he needs a biopsy to confirm that he actually has atopic dermatitis because sometimes it's really not that easy to diagnose atopic dermatitis in patients with skin of color. So let's see what we get in there, what you guys decide to do, how we will be perceived. Okay, we have a bit of a mixed picture here. 52% say, let's just focus on his skincare and therapy alone, and the other one third actually says, let's get rid of peanuts, eggs, and milk for a while and kind of see where their skin clears. All right, let's circle back and take a look at the literature. This is interesting. Let's see. Okay, do I have access? Can I advance the slide? I'll try again. There is always a delay. Okay, great. So it's clearly confusing. And I think we all recognize that. So the Quad AI actually published just this year a work group report, which is entitled uh, Atopic Dermatitis and Food Allergy Best Practices and Knowledge Gaps. Again, they mentioned that the immunologic mechanisms that link food allergy and atopic dermatitis are not well known. Here on the left side is um, uh, table number two. And the title of table number two is Best Practices in the Approach to Food Allergy Evaluation in Atopic Dermatitis. And as you can see, it's complicated. But basically, it, what they're trying to tell us is that food allergy and atopic dermatitis are often co co-expressed. Focus on optimizing skin care. Use shared decision making when pursuing testing and elimination. Do not just test indiscriminately. And elimination of diets often leads to immediate food allergies. So what does that mean? Right now, James is eating all the foods that he tested positive to. If we ask James to stop eating these foods, let's say for six months, when we reintroduce that food, let's say wheat, he now can develop a severe allergic reaction. So right now he's tolerating the food, but if you stop giving him the food on a regular basis and he has a lot of IgE floating around, when you reintroduce the food after a while, he, you can see allergic reactions. If a patient presents with a food, um, with a true allergic reaction, they should have food allergy education and management they should receive an epinephrine powder injector and know when to use it. All right, so the dual exposure hypothesis suggests that oral tolerance to food antigens is promoted through high dose oral exposure, meaning James is eating wheat on a regular basis, where food sensitization and food allergy are promoted through lower dose cutaneous exposure, particularly through the inflamed skin. He probably has a lot of IgE floating around because it's been exposed through the skin, but he can tolerate the food because he's eating it. So if, again, if he stopped giving James these foods, he may develop an allergic reaction. To help us better help our patients there, um, last year a consensus was published between the American Academy of Allergy Immunology, the American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, and the Canadian Society for Allergy and Clinical Immunology. They asked several different clinical questions Question number one was what criteria define an infant at high risk for the development of food allergy? And the answer is severe eczema. The other answer is also moderate to mild to moderate eczema, as well as a family history of ATP and an infant known to have other food allergies. And finally, no risk factors at all. So it's, it's a little bit tricky to answer that question. In fact, there is no international consensus at all. And some of this data is from the LEAP trial. And the LEAP trial was such a, a, a major publication that I just briefly want to go, go over the LEAP trial. So LEAP stands for early um, education about peanut, early education about peanut allergy. Um, Gideon Lack is an allergist in London who, um, with his colleague, published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, about now, um, I think seven years ago. They looked at 640 children 
they were young, they ranged in age from four to 11 months, and they either had severe atopic nephritis or they had an egg allergy. When they were skin tested to peanuts, and if the size of the skin was too big, they were excluded. And they were, they were asked to eat a lot of peanuts, so six grams per peanut per week. They did this for five years, and after the half years, they were all challenged to peanuts. And if you can see in the right lower corner, um, the kids who ate the peanuts, they only developed a peanut allergy in about 3% of the cases. And the kids who were asked not to eat peanuts um, developed peanut allergy in 17% of the cases. So clearly, all exposure is very important. So as a society, we were kind of slow to embrace these new guidelines. So Matthew Greenhart looked into that a little bit to ask why aren't we all feeding our babies peanuts? There are various implementations. Moms were scared, moms and dads were scared. They had a fear of, of their child reacting and that happened in about 36%. They also had a fear of their child choking. And they found there are not that many great um, ways to introduce peanuts into a diet of a six month old. And in all fairness, the guidance in terms of food algae has shifted no less than four times since the year 2000. So here are a few do's and don'ts. Do not send food panels. They are often not very helpful, helpful especially to, to food. I spend a lot of my time explaining to parents that their, their child is not allergic to the food and that they shouldn't um, avoid these foods that they can tolerate. Eliminate, elimination, elimination diets can be very tricky as well because again, when the food is reintroduced, it can lead to anaphylaxis. Eliminate, elimination diets, hard word, can also lead to nutritional deficiencies and they can be very expensive. They can also lead to anxiety. Two, the other things that we should do is we should encourage early introduction of foods based on the LEAP trial. And if you truly see an allergic reaction, um, you should refer to an allergist for further evaluation uh, and education. So again, why not test everyone to everything? That question comes up quite a bit. Food allergy is really complicated to diagnose. High levels to um, high levels of IgE to allergens are not always clinically relevant. We call that sensitization. And in terms of skin testing, so a skin test has a fairly good negative predictive value, meaning if your skin test in the skin test is negative, that's very helpful. But if the skin test is positive, it doesn't prove that you're truly allergic to the food. Circling back to the quad AI, they also mention house dust mites. What are dust mites? Dust mites are these tiny creatures. You cannot see them with them. You can either not see them with the naked eye. They don't bite and they're not bed bugs. They list off our dead skin cells. So we all have them in our bedding. Um, they're a big source of allergens. They can make allergies worse. They can make eczema worse. They can make asthma worse. Again, they live in our mattresses, in our bedding, in our furniture, in our carpets, in our curtains. And if you can imagine, if you shed a lot of dead skin, you probably have a lot of dust mites around. I'm so sorry. What can we do for our patients who have atopic dermatitis and dust mite allergies? Well, um, the Quad AI and the college actually looked at the patients and took a look at the patients, the FDA approved immunotherapy for patients of atopic dermatitis. And so they did a meta analysis to see whether that actually helped. Um, they looked at 23 randomized controlled trials, about a little bit less than 2,000 patients in 13 countries and four continents. We have two ways to give allergy immunotherapy, either subcutaneous, so a little shot in the arm, or a drop or a pill under the tongue. Most of these patients were monosensitized to dust mites, so they were only allergic to dust mites, and about 4% or so were also allergic to pollen. They looked at two outcomes, eczema severity and eczema quality of life, and they saw a significant um, improvement in the score for atopic dermatitis. Um, with both sublingual and subcutaneous, and they also saw a significant improvement of quality of life. We did see local reactions, both local reactions, injection site reactions, as well as an itchy tongue when you take the drops or the pill. And we do sometimes see systemic reactions, both um, sublingual, less so than with the subcutaneous. But they did say that subcutaneous and sublingual uh, therapy to air allergens, particularly house dust mites, can importantly improve atopic dermatitis severity and quality of life. So that's something to think about. Circling back to our patient James. So which evidence-based 
decisions should we make? So number one, we've learned a lot about ceramides tonight. We should definitely have a good skincare regimen for change. And in terms of treatments, that's a shared decision-making process. We have options now, topical, biologic, small molecule. We definitely have good options to, to get James better. James mentions when he cleans his room, he starts sneezing and his skin gets a little bit more itchy. So we could definitely evaluate him for dust mite sensitivities and or offer him immunotherapy. And at this point, we do, we do not want to change his diet whatsoever. He's tolerating all these foods. We don't want to take them away. We will focus on skincare first, on treatment first, uh, before we take any foods away. Again, some take-home pearls, atopic dermatitis and skin of color from the allergist perspective. Uh, we've learned that atopic dermatitis can be more severe and more persistent in patients with skin of color. It can be part of the atopic march, although that doesn't seem to be written in stone. Consider allergic comorbidities. True food allergies requires further uh, consultation certain for certain. Avoid sending panels and restrictive diets. They are often not very helpful. And once you are allergic to food, it's really hard to take that away. So um, it, it's always heartbreaking when somebody was able to eat a food and then they were restricted. And then on reintroduction, they weren't able to eat it anymore. Early and sustained controls are best in uh, best at ease and best outcome. Thank you. So remember, if you want to submit a question, please use the question chat pane on the right hand side of your screen. And again, I wrote a little note there so you could see where you need to write the questions. And if you have any additional questions after this session, you can always send them to info at idfeducationalseries.com. Again, the certificate will be emailed to you. Please fill it in. And then the link to uh, get your uh, certificate and your points is here. You might want to jot this down, but it would also be emailed to you one to two days after. And if you have any questions, please contact Medical Education Resources at this number or Sykes at cmepartner.org. Again, we'd like to thank Insight Dermatology for making this educational event possible. So Dr. Glick, I think we have some questions from the audience. We do, we do. We have several questions and I'd love for the panel to jump back on because uh, uh, there's a lot of information that our colleagues uh, want to know. So, um, uh, Dr. Am Alexis, I'm actually going to start with you. We've got a question that asks, what is the best time to introduce peanuts and eggs to toddlers with eczema? Tell us. Thanks. Thank you for that question. That seems to come up quite a bit. So our focus at this point is really to prevent peanut allergy from happening. So early is definitely better than later. Um, basically, based on the LEAP trial, we, we say uh, four to six months. And we do want the child to be developmentally ready for that. Sometimes patients are scared. And if they are, that's fine. Come see us. We can do all challenges in the office. We can watch you feed the food. Um, but earlier is better. In terms of eggs, the data doesn't show that it may prevent um, egg allergy, but there's no contraindication in waiting. Um, so the benefit, again, is to introduce food early. Again, you want the child to be sitting up and being interested in, and curious in, food, in foods. But we're, again, we're talking um, four to six months here. And Dr. Herbert, please jump right in. Well, I, I just want to say thank you. Um, I wish I had a recording of everything you said about food allergy because like you, in pediatric dermatology, we spend so much time because parents are just convinced it's what they're feeding their child or what they're eating if the mom is breastfeeding. So I would love to have a video of what you just said to share with uh, concerned parents and patients. I think that, that what you have shared with us is just so much value. And I, I hope I can repeat it as effectively as you delivered it this evening. But thanks so much for that great review of food allergy not playing the role that so many thought it did for so many years. Thank you. Andrew, you have some comments as well? Are you asking Andrew or are you asking oh, you're me? You're asking me to weigh in. Oh, well, I, I, there's nothing else I can add to that. And, 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 and thank you to both Dr. Abera and Dr. Alexis for, the, for, the, for their talks. But no, uh, on, that, uh, on that topic of uh, introducing uh, foods or re restricting foods, I completely defer to, to the smarter Dr. Alexis. Uh, <laughs> uh, so nothing else to add there. 
Well, correct. I, I, I think that was very well said. While I have you on the podium, Dr. Emma Alexis, uh, how do you eliminate dust mites? What are your recommendations for the audience? Oh, well, that's great. Um, I often ask, how old is your pillow? How many stuffed animals do you have on your bed? That's for mostly for the kids. You know, and so again, dust mites are everywhere. They're in, in curtains and carpets. If you don't eat your carpet at home, that's great. You, well, we kill dust mites by washing everything, but sometimes that's hard to do. It's hard to wash your pillow constantly, so get dust mite covers. Clutter, wherever you can reduce clutter, that's all helpful. So clutter, bedding, carpets, uh, washing things in hot water. Um, anything you can add, Dr. Herbert, I'm sharing. Well, one of the things we sometimes recommend is the pristine fabric that'll at least get the, the the dust mites in the bed, maybe reduce it. I also recommend the pillow changing. I think that that's something people don't take into account, and it, I think it can be very helpful. I know in Houston, we have a lot of allergic rhinitis, and many people don't change their pillow that often, and so it is something we suggest. Um, but the only other thing I would add, maybe a HEPA filter sometimes. Oh, and not having the dog sleep in the bed or be in the room with them. And of course, avoid smoking if they can. That's not specific to dust mites, but maybe to general well-being for patients with atopic dermatitis. One more thing, dust mites love humidity. So it's, it's always just people love the humidifier. That doesn't always work in your favor. Fantastic. Question just popped up, and I'll throw it out to really all three of you. Clinical question based on patient experience: nine-year-old child allergic to almond and other nuts on skin testing tolerates almond milk, but the almond oil causes urticaria. Is there a difference in potency of nut oils? For example, almonds, uh, peanuts, um, uh, uh, others. Uh, if um, if a person can tolerate the food despite the allergy. Uh, is there any knowledge that topical oils are more allergenic? Well, I'll, I'll start. I'll start okay. off with the article, the the fluoroquinone oil, which is a peanut-based oil, which Amy Paller and colleagues published in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. They did the um, specific testing to look at the allergenicity, and it didn't have any of the allergenic components. So I don't think that you can group all oils together, I think that might not be wise. You'd have to look at each one specifically, and the testing can be done in that article in the blue, in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology outlines it, it was uh, fluoroquinone oil, um, the Dermasmooth, if anybody wants to know the brand name, uh, they did not find allergenic properties in that particular topical oil that we use for atopic dermatitis. And I'm yes, not sure that I understand. Oh, go ahead, please. The, 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 I understand the question uh, correctly. Can she drink almond milk and when she puts alm almond oil on her skin, she gets a rash? Because those are two different different entities. I would say one is contact dermatitis and one is food allergy. So if she can drink almond milk, let her drink almond milk. I think she needs to have a reaction with the almond oil on her skin. Is that correct? Yeah, I, you, you got it exactly correct, yes. Yes, and I just, uh, the, the individual just said yes. <laughs> okay, okay. We see that with shrimp as well. Some people can't, when they peel shrimp, they get a crazy rash, but they can eat the food without having a reaction. So it's actually two different disease entities. Don't stop giving the almond milk. <laughs> I have just found to be allergic to eggs. Do they have to avoid all foods with eggs uh, in them, with all, eggs in them, uh, such as, let's say, cookies, cakes, et cetera? I think I missed the beginning, but um, the question is, if you're allergic to eggs, you have to avoid all kinds of eggs. There yes. is really nice data that shows that I think it's up to 60% of kids who are egg allergic can tolerate baked eggs. Now, every child is different. I don't know how high the numbers are, but I would recommend seeing your allergist um, and doing an oral challenge to baked egg um, because there are, not, there are studies that show that if you can tolerate baked egg first, you're more likely to grow your egg allergy over time or maybe a little bit faster um, if you're exposed to baked eggs. But not everybody can eat eggs, we eat baked eggs, but the majority can. So your allergist and get that all food challenge going. Wonderful. Dr. Andrew Alexis has a question specifically for you here. How do you manage post-inflammatory pigmentary alterations secondary to atopic dermatitis? 
Yeah, thank you, Brad. That you know that is such a um, a very a very relevant real world question that actually doesn't have a, a great answer because unlike other disorders of hyperpigmentation, let's say melasma, for example, where we frequently use our triple combination hydroquinone, retinoid, corticosteroid formulation, um, here's a scenario where doing using our tried and true gold standard might actually uh, uh, aggravate uh, atopic dermatitis um, given the, the you know the, the known barrier dysfunction and highly reactive uh, nature of the skin of atopics so one has to be very careful to make sure that you're you're treating the patients are treating areas of hyperpigmentation that are completely burnt out that are not in any way active uh, from an inflammatory standpoint that's number one. And if you are going to act actively treat the hyperpigmentation, I uh, prefer to use topical azelaic acid, 15% foam, and I'll couple that with a with a with a corticosteroid. Um, but I'm actually far more enthusiastic about just treating the underlying uh, disease, atopic dermatitis, effectively over time, and and waiting for that hyperpigmentation to resolve because of the the issues of potentially uh, inducing uh, stinging, burning, and 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 uh, inducing more uh, 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 eczematous lesions if there's an irritant uh, dermatitis phenomenon from some of the topical uh, bleaching agents we use. I wasn't aware of the commercial availability of the azelaic acid in a foam. I'm trying to think of which particular product or if it's a branded product, but I like that idea. Um, Andy, is, is it in, a, in like an emollient vehicle, which is kind of apropos for the setting of atopic dermatitis because some of these foams will have some alcohol basis to them? Exactly. That's why I prefer when you can get it. It's not always accessible to all patients based on their insurance formulary, but when you do have the choice, I do like that uh, foam 15% azelaic acid uh, product because yes, that that foam vehicle is indeed um, uh, has some hydrating properties and, and is less uh, irritating than the uh, uh, generic gel. Um, I would just say when I talk to patients, when I communicate to patients, what they can treat and what they can't treat with, with respect to using a bleaching agent. I, I have them actually palpate their own lesions and, and be able to differentiate between an area where there's texture, where they can feel some elevation, scaling, and that's an active area. And I say, that's we're not treating that with the bleaching agent. But if it's an area that's completely flat and smooth and hyperpigmented and there's, uh, and there's hyperpigmented and there's no itching at all, um, then that would be a potential target for the bleaching agent. But one has to carefully go over that with patients. I love the insight in the differences for other disorders of uh, dyspigmentation and dyschromia. Um, uh, anyone else have additional comments regarding managing post-inflammatory pigmentary alteration uh, in the setting of atopic dermatitis? Uh, the only thing I would add, and maybe I, I, well, you're in Florida, I'm in Houston. Um, I, I advise them about photoprotection if they're going to be out in the sun, just because they can pigment even more, which is disappointing to them if they're trying to alleviate that. So an education about a sunscreen that will be tolerated in an atopic patient, and I have my certain favorites, I think goes a long way um, in, in helping them to get back to their baseline skin color. Fantastic. A question just popped up here. Would you recommend avoiding potent corticosteroids under occlusion for skin of color patients to minimize the chance of hypopigmentation? Uh, Emma, you want to handle that one? Not sure if you're muted. Yeah, I think I'm muted. Um, there you go. I think I'm going to defer that one right to Andrew. <laughs> hey, no problem. <laughs> so the question is whether um, um, we would use um, potent or super potent topical corticosteroids in patients, under occlusion even, uh, in patients with skin of color. And uh, I think I, it's certainly a consideration in the, in, there are certain scenarios that would call for that, you know, a recalcitrant uh, hand dermatitis, I think was the example, uh, but warning the patient 
that uh, hypopigmentation from the corticosteroid is a likely uh, outcome. But reassure them that if, if that does occur, it's temporary. And I, by all means, you wouldn't be doing the steroids under occlusion for an, an extended period of time. So I think it's appropriate if the patient is warned and patient is comfortable with that potential outcome and you're doing it for a limited period of time. I think it's acceptable on a case-by-case -case basis. And one thing I'll add is for some patients, particularly if they're having trouble with itching, I use the um, steroid embedded tape. It's clear, it comes on a roll in two sizes. It's not covered on many insurances, which can make it expensive. But if it is covered, it, it can be a real boon and patients appreciate it because it seems to reduce itching. And I don't know if that's just the stimuli that trigger the itch on the surface of the skin or allayed, or it's just the um, compliance with getting the lesion covered with the steroid very effectively and the maintenance of that uh, steroid embedded tape over the area that's still actively involved. I have found that helpful as well. I'm just looking here in the, in the questions in the, in the chat here, actually my colleague from here in Florida, I got to do a little shout out to Dr. Phyllis Skolnick who just commented that, you know, you can use Aquaphor healing ointment plus Neutrogena Shear Zinc sunscreen uh, in these patients. Uh, nice comment. Dr. Aber, while we've got you on the stage here, there are several questions that just popped up for you. Are filaggrin mutations seen in all patients with atopic dermatitis? No, it's definitely not true. Um, this was such a novel discovery, again, accrediting Virginia Seibert, who first reported it in ichthyosis vulgaris, but it took our Irish colleagues to really bring forward the construct that indeed they were seeing it. But even in that group with some subsequent studies found that particularly in African-American patients, they did not see, or African patients as well, they did not see the filaggrin mutation. So it's not universal. And that's always intriguing to us. Um, but these are variants we have to deal with. And as a result, we really do need to define our therapies based on what the patient manifests and what's bothering them most. Uh, but moisturizers should form uh, one of the basic elements of our therapeutic, therapeutic ladder. And we know from the various um, guidance documents that have come out, whether they're from the Far East in Europe uh, or the United States, uh, moisturizers really are formative in the way that we're going to start our regimen for these patients as they go forward. Since we're talking about the barrier, we're talking about filaggrin, you talked a lot about steramides. Look, there's another question that's uh, asking, uh, is there evidence-based research on the barrier repair capabilities of ceramides applied to the skin of atopic patients? Actually, there is, and I did show a slide which was one of the earliest publications. It's in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, I believe from 2006. Sarah Chamblin, Peter Elias, and others looked at a product which was called Triceram. It was the original ceramide combination. Peter Elias, of course, who gave us such formative work understanding the barrier defect in atopic dermatitis really put this forward. And what they showed on electron microscopy by applying this product, they actually were able to restore the lipid bilayer. And I don't think we'd ever seen that before, at least not in the electron microscopy realm. So that really changed our, our idea. And what I tell parents is, instead of trying to take something away, i.e. the food, which they think is causing it, I really try to bring those parents into the mode of, no, what you need to do is add something in. And that that's something that I want them to add is the moisturizer, particularly a ceramide, um, based moisturizer. Here's something you can control. You can control that barrier defect if you just put this moisturizer on twice a day. I'm not going to say it's 100%. I'm not going to say it works all the time, and I'm not going to say that's the only therapy, but certainly parents like to have a sense that they are actually able to improve that skin barrier either for themselves or their children, uh, and this is one arena where we can assure them that that will happen and the patient usually will improve very rapidly. Question for the entire group, of course. Uh, how would you compare the efficacy of topical ruxolitinib versus topical corticosteroids? And what about the efficacy of topinarov or topical reflumolast? Well, Who wants I, to jump I, in? I, I yeah, would, there you go. <laughs> I would say I've done some of the clinical trials, and I'm, I'm going to be a little bit vague because of my confidentiality agreement, but I will say so far, I'm, I'm, uh, very impressed with what I've seen. We've done some open label trials. So I know the patient was really on the medicine and I've been very fortunate to be able to treat very young patients with some of these new medicines. 
and I'm really looking forward to the opportunity when we actually have FDA approval, and I, I hope that will be forthcoming. Of course, I don't have the full data set, but I think these are really promising avenues for us. And of course, we all want steroid-free products because we have a lot of steroid-phobic patients and parents, and really, steroids are not the perfect uh, agent for a long-term regimen. They can be used for acute flares. They can be used intermittently. They're very effective. They're cost-effective. They're on the pharma pharmaceutical list of almost every insurance company. But we do need other uh, regimens that we can use. And based on my early impressions, and that's what they truly are, just early impressions, I think we really have some exciting um, new medicines that we'll be looking forward to using for our patients who suffer with atopic dermatitis. We do have a newly approved product. I believe this is approved down to the age of 12 and ruxolitinib cream. Um, uh, I may be asking the entire group, but um, Andrew, what, what has been your experience using uh, rux cream? Yeah, my experience using topical ruxolitinib 1.5% cream has been, has been very favorable. Um, I think that, you know, it really satisfies one of those gaps that we've had for such a long time where we've We've had our non-corticosteroid topical options, but they've had some limitations, limitations in efficacy in some cases, it actually across the board, I'd say, of our previous ones, uh, some limitations in tolerability, such as stinging and burning, particularly in sensitive locations like the eyelid or other facial locations, uh, body folds. Um, we've had limitations as far as vehicle, some, you know, Let's take tacrolimus ointment, for example. While it might be efficacious on the eyelids and in other facial sites, the ointment vehicle is often a barrier for, for many of our patients. And some patients also experience application site reactions from that too. So the topical ruxolinib has really sort of overcome a lot of those, the, 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 those issues with our previous uh, agents. I've not seen tolerability issues. I think it, it's very well tolerated uh, across any anatomic location, including the face. I'd love to hear Dr. Evers uh, uh, comment on that, because, uh, especially treating uh, younger patients. Um, uh, but uh, it's been my experience has been very tolerable. From an efficacy standpoint, uh, there are no head-to-head -head, uh, uh, studies that I'm aware of, uh, but my impressions clinically is that it's certainly superior to uh, our other non-corticosteroid topical agents currently available. And I'd maybe say I see responses that are comparable to a mid-potency corticosteroid, but I'd love to hear your, your impressions, Brad and, and uh, Adelaide, about that too. One of the well, things I, I would say... Go ahead. Oh, go, go, go ahead. Please. Okay. No, I certainly agree. And one thing you didn't mention, Andrew, is the you mentioned steroid pomia, but Emma and I take care of kids who don't want shots. So it really, we really get sometimes remarkable pushback with regard to the issue of giving a child a shot on an ongoing basis. And so here we have a drug which is topical, which is usually less frightening for the parent too. And we have this option that I think has really helped patients tremendously. I've been, like you, very pleased at the tolerability, very good acceptability. Um, I am a big fan of the product because it is well tolerated. Again, we don't have to go through the whole issue related to shots. We get away from the steroid phobia and the, the agent works very well. It's, it's, it's just been a great um, therapy to have in our toolbox. And I think we're very fortunate that Insight moved forward to bring this into topical formulation for dermatologists and allergists to help their patients. And I'll just uh, add to your um, comments about the excitement of some of the topicals in the pipeline for AD, like Roflumilast and Tepinarov. And I too have, uh, am serving as an investigator, so I, I can't really uh, comment too much on, on, on where those, uh, on, on any data yet. But uh, excited to see when it when when the phase threes are done. Um, I think you, you wanted to make some comments as well. No, I just I completely agree. It's um, you know, it's almost so as as a somebody who treats pediatric patients, when we get that indication twelve years in the buff, we're like, oh, but what about the rest of our children, right? So um, we're excited to be able to treat even our younger children in the future. 
Yeah, I think for me, Andrew, it's about you know, my, my, my observation, you know, for me as well, too, in the clinical trials, as I recall, close to 40% of the patients uh, had atopic dermatitis on their face. And I find particularly in those adolescents and even, of course, the younger kids, uh, we don't have that approval. But nevertheless, you know, when it's on the face, it's kind of a challenge for us. You know, we're a little concerned, so are the parents, about the use of corticosteroids. So to have a product that will allow us to be able to even use corticosteroids in a more favorable way, in more like, if you will, burst therapy, I think is great. And the fact that we can use this safely, and in my experience, I haven't really seen particular irritancy. Uh, to me, that's that's been uh, really quite helpful. Um, we also had a question, uh, Dr. Aber, for you about what therapies for atopic dermatitis are approved um, for the youngest patients who have atopic dermatitis. So, you know, I guess maybe like how far down, which products, uh, et cetera. Well, we're certainly more limited, as, as Emma just mentioned, uh, as we get into the younger crowd. And let's face it, we see atopic dermatitis often starting at three months of age, sometimes a little sooner. And we, we don't have the broad armamentarium that we have in older patients. So we have some topical steroids that we have approved down to the three months of age. We're very fortunate. Um, the first of that was uh, fluticasone. And that's that's available. And of course, we even have over-the-counter fluticasone. It's a nasal spray for people with allergic rhinitis. So we know that drug because it's a soft molecule. It doesn't penetrate into the skin deeply. It goes into the skin and tends to stay there. Uh, we have desonide, which is approved uh, in uh, patients. The um, fluocinonide oil is approved for kids uh, down in the lower age groups as well. Uh, there are a few other steroids that we can use that are FDA approved. Then we have dupilumab, which is approved in the very youngest age group, and I think that's exciting. We do need, as Emma uh, implicated, many more drugs to get down to the youngest age group because these children, where do we see the most eczema? It's in these really young patients. Where do these children lose sleep? Then the parents lose sleep. It's the whole uh, disruption of the, of the family that occurs here. So. Um, we do hope all of the pharmaceutical companies will take into consideration we very much need and want and will use these these products as they get FDA approval down in the younger age group, provided we can assure ourselves and our patients of the safety as well as the efficacy. Fantastic. So well said. You know, there's a, a question and kind of a comment here. Uh, some of the challenges that we face and you know, we've got wonderful products and new new products have been added into the toolbox, but the individual asked, I've had a very tough time getting insurance companies to cover topical ruxolitinib, even Eucrisa, uh, some of the generics, including tacrolimus and pomicrolimus. And these are great drugs and they're non-steroidal. And that's what this individual is asking here. And so I, I would ask to you, it's really not a question, but uh, and she's saying here, it's a, it's a shame and I agree. And there's challenges with Medicare patients when we need these products over the age of 65. Anyone want to jump in with some 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 tricks and tips? It's a toughie. Well, I will I will just say we try to use the um, specialty pharmacies because they do help us with the prior auths. Um, that's a big help. Um, I will say that our local reps are often good at guiding us to the reps. Um, pharmacies that, that have been most successful in rendering our patients able to get these medications. But I too have experienced a challenge and I think it behooves our pharmaceutical colleagues to, our pharma um, pharmaceutical company colleagues to really work with us to try to get broad coverage because we will use these medicines. We just can't seem to get them into the hands of our patients sometimes, even though we very much wish it to, to occur. I will say one other comment in Texas, we have a very, very effective uh, Texas uh, Insurance Commission, and when I really can't get care for the patient, whether it's a prescription or a different therapy, I will have the patient write uh, to the insurance commission, and sometimes that's one way to procure treatments that otherwise seem to be unavailable to the patient. Uh, well said. Um, I'll just add that um, sometimes um, when when push comes to shove and you have to write a let you have to just write write a letter of appeal uh, when when one of these agents is denied, I find that the AAD's um, resource that offers a template for appeal letters, I do turn to that quite a bit, and I'll modify that for the for the particular 
drug I'm working working to uh, try to get approved. But anyway, that's a nice resource, the AAD's uh, website, where you can download a template for um, for letters. Oh, and just in terms of letters, one more thing to add. I've also found if I if I really am in, in bind and I, the, it's something very critical the patient must get. Um, uh, I can have the pay I'll encourage the patient to write a letter themselves too on top of my letter and that tends to be uh, I found in some instances that was more influential than my own letter yeah uh, Andy I would just say that um, that resource is uh, known as the practice management center and so for the uh, individuals on the call you can do um, aad.org and it's a forward slash practice management center and I agree with you completely we use those all the time they're absolutely fantastic a really good question just popped up, um, and it's a tough one. How do you counsel? I'm going to throw this first to Dr. Aber because Dr. Aber has asked me this question before, so I'm going to ask you this question, and that is, how do you counsel on safety for top topical ruxolitinib, hence the black box warning? Do you even bring it up? No, and we can really go around the horn here because I I think this is a very important question. We have talked about this. Fred, I did include in my slide because I think it's helpful. Because this drug has been available in systemic form since 2011, and again, it's used for um, certain hematologic uh, conditions um, that we don't treat in dermatology, but it's also, it is used for graft versus host that is non-responsive to steroids, which might fall in the parameter of a dermatologist. Certainly my colleagues in my department at MD Anderson do treat that. Um, but since the systemic drug, which has been available already for 11 years, does not have a black box warning, I use that as my defining uh, terminology. And why do we get a black box warning on this drug? I think we should answer that question. Uh, JAKs get a black box warning. Uh, it's just a global part of their package insert. Now, that wasn't true in 2011, but because of some of the JAKs that have been used primarily for conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, where um, MACE and, and blood clots did occur uh, post-release of these drugs, the black box warning was applied. I think that was appropriate, but uh, it was unusual that a topical medicine would get a jack, but it got it as a class warning. So again, I give, I give the insight that since 2011, ruxolidinib is available systemically, no black box warning. I think that gives me a lot of reassurance. The FDA did not see that it was imperative to go back and give a black box warning to this systemic drug. So it's it's sort of an inverse of what we would think. We typically think the systemic drug would have the black box and the topical would not. It's not true in this case. That is so interesting. I actually did not know that fine point, um, Dr. Ibarra, until tonight. So I am, I am gonna use that as well in my practice. Um, the, what I do is similar with the exception of that extra point where I contextualize, well, where does this black box come from? Why is it there? And and explain that it's for across the class. It's It comes from data from taking it systemically. And when I explain to the patient that this is 1.5% cream that is being applied to a limited body surface area, they can understand that, okay, it's it, there's a little bit of, it's apples and oranges as far as uh, 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 risk. thing that I would add is that, you know, there were two arms in the clinical trials and one was a lower strength. And I think when the FDA is very picky and they are at times, you know, for them to approve the higher strength, I think is encouraging. And so I kind of tie that in as well too. And I think that the, you know, the area under the curve, some of the pharmacokinetic uh, data and what we've learned with the maximal use study also makes us pretty comfortable that when we look at it compared to the oral, uh, that the concentrations that are absorbed uh, even down to the age of 12 uh, appear to be uh, uh, much lower and lower than what we see in adults. Um, any other comments in, in that regard? No, I think your your point about the not using it on the the entire body surface area it does have a restriction in how much we apply, and I, I believe it's 10%. We're not supposed to go over 10% body surface area with this particular drug, and I think that's because of the concern if you put enough on, there might be uh, the risk of of some of the uh, conditions that that brought on the black box warning. Uh, but I I have to say, and I I would love to hear the comments of others. I haven't heard of any uh, FDA warnings come out since it's been released in a topical form. Uh, I don't know if anybody on the the in the audience is here from inside, but it 
we would have heard, I believe, since we're all interested in this drug and use this drug, we probably would have heard if there were some concerns that have been raised post-release. We've had this drug out since late 2000, I think December 2021, and I'm not aware of any adverse events that have been severe or of concern, but perhaps my colleagues have heard otherwise, but maybe they could comment. No, we're seeing a all. lot. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of head bobbing in the right direction as no, and 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 I would I would very much uh, agree with that. But I, I think it's also a really good point, and I think it might be 20%, but that would be the maximum cap. Uh, we could always circle back to the office uh, audience for the absolute correct on that, but clearly uh, there is a limitation on the body service area. You know, we're winding down here. This discussion has been great, but there's one more really important question that has popped up, and that is uh, for Dr. Amalexis, and that is, what is the safest way to introduce nuts into a toddler's diet? And, and I would also ask, uh, through the questioning that we have here, is how frequently uh, do they have to be eaten? That's, that's actually a great question. So nuts are choking hazards. So what you want to do is you want to take smooth peanut butter and add some fluid to it to make it a little bit thinner. Um, and once you introduce a food, it has to stay in a diet on a regular basis. I often have parish, patients who say, I gave you know peanut butter at, at six months and then again at a year, and then they see a reaction. Once you introduce it, as we've seen through the LEAP trial, it has to be given on a weekly, minimum weekly basis. So in the past, we used to say, you know, eat as the family pleases. Now we're a lot more proactive about things and say it has to be given a few times a week. There's actually a great um, article in Jackie in Practice that has a great little um, table that tells you which foods to introduce, how much of these foods to introduce, and how often to give. Um, maybe we can put it in the chat box. It's, it's a great article. So again, once you introduce the food, it has to be in the food in the diet on a regular basis. Fantastic. Um, really, from what I can see here in the Q and A, it looks like that's that was the last question, and it was a really a good one to end on. I have to say that having had the opportunity to do a number of these um, IDEF uh, webinars, that uh, this has been so fantastic, incredibly engaging. I think that. We answered a lot of very intriguing questions. Uh, I want to thank both Drs. Alexis and also Dr. Aber uh, for their just amazing presentations, uh, for your time and your experience. And I know that I uh, learned a tremendous amount. So, Roxanne, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to close out. And thank you, Dr. Glick, for an amazing moderation. So thank you all for joining us this evening, and please remember to join us. Uh, the next webinar is December 6th, and we're going to have a presentation from Dr. Morera on psoriasis, Are You Treating the Big Picture?, as well as on December 13th on how to navigate the changing landscape of dermatology and industry relationship with Frank Watanabe, who is Chief Executive Officer of Arcutus uh, Biotherapeutics. So thank you all again for joining us. Have a great evening. Bye now.